Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the webinar we are hosting today. It's December 4, 2020, and we are at the cusp of the Christmas season, a season that brings heightened consumerism, which is why our topic today is very relevant. So again, we're here to, first of all, welcome everyone, and including our participants and our guests. And our topic today is the decade of sustainability, how the Philippines can end its plastic crisis. So I'm P. Renada, a reporter for Rappler, uh, and I'm today, I'm your host for today. Um, I just want to begin you know, with something of an introduction about uh, our topic. And it's about really the crisis that our generation faces, and it's about how to end plastic ending up in nature and also in clogging up our lives, in making things um, difficult for uh, biodiversity, for human cities, and for everyone on this planet, especially given climate change and its implications on, on, hum on humanity and on the living things on this earth. So just to recap all about this plastic problem and why it's extra relevant today, especially in 2020, it's because we're faced with the pandemic and we all know how the pandemic has changed our consumerist habits. Uh, for one thing, diba, we tend to order a lot home from home and we get deliveries from home. And um, a study uh, by the Alliance to End Plastic Waste has said that um, plastic waste in Thailand, a Southeast Asian country just like ours, increased from 1,500 tons to 6,300 tons per day just because of food deliveries Going, going to different residences. So that's a big, big difference that the pandemic has made on our lives. Um, at the same time, it's a health crisis that calls on the use of disposables. At least that's what many people believe, right? That we need disposables that will keep us safe because we have to throw away contaminated material. And it's been estimated that medical frontliners need 89 million medical masks, 76 million gloves, and 1.6 million goggles every month according to the World Health Organization. So it's created a big problem, right? We've always had a problem with plastics, but um, even more so today where the use of plastics has gone up um, a lot. So it's a problem that is that involves everyone from the big companies who make products we use every day to governments who are supposed to protect the environment and to consumers and citizens who use these products and make decisions daily on how to dispose of their trash. So today, uh, we're going to ask very relevant questions such as, how did the lockdown inspire you to manage your plastic wastes? And what re recycling practices or methods are you doing at home? Uh, especially given we're all stuck here and we're all trying to find a way through this pandemic. So uh, with that, we're going to open with a very exciting lineup of guests, um, people who are experts in this field. Uh, let me just introduce um, our first uh, resource person who will actually give the opening remarks for today's webinar. So uh, let me just introduce uh, Worldwide Fund for Nature Executive Direct Director Joel Palma. Um, and uh, Mr. Palma serves as the Executive Director of the Worldwide Fund for Nature Philippines, also known as Kabang Kalikasan ng Pilipinas Foundation, Inc. Before joining WWF, he handled the Pawikan Conservation Project of the DNR as a project manager for the Turtle Islands project in Turtle Islands, Tawi-Tawi. So let's welcome Mr. Palma to give the opening remarks. Hi, it's uh, so nice to be here again with Rappler and uh, to discuss sustainability. Uh, we're very honored to, to have Congressman uh, Rufus Rodriguez here because, you know, in, in our initial discussions as well and, 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 uh, uh, and, and uh, webinars, you know, uh, uh, he's been very supportive of, of sustainability and plastics. Um, our title for today is uh, A Decade of Sustainability. Um, I guess, you know, it's right because we have no choice. We only have 10 years to, to make ourselves sustainable beyond uh, what we are right now. Just to give you an example, uh, nine years ago, 11 years ago was Ondoy. That degree or that scale of flooding is a one to 100 year uh, uh, possibility of flooding. And, you know, after Undoy, so that, that one, one, one every 100 year flooding means that the possibility of that scale of flooding would occur 1% every year. 
But this happened after 11 years. So the Ondoy type of a flooding in just 10 years is now 10% per year that can happen. And this is all because of climate change. Then why is climate change so connected with plastic? Is it connected? I say yes, because you know, plastic is produced from petrol and fossil fuels. And there was a study done that uh, pre-COVID or quarantine uh, times, the uh, amount of fossil fuel used to produce plastic is equivalent to the aviation industry. So it's a lot. And, and, and just to give you a practical example, you know, our office is in Mindanao Avenue, we're in Quezon City, where the elevation of Quezon City is one of the highest in Metro Manila. It should not flood there. But right in the corner of our office, got flooded. You know why? Because of four or five pieces of plastic, plastic bags, you know, uh, that's been plugged into the drainage. And we got a knee deep flooding, even if the elevation of Quezon City is probably 10, 20, 30 meter above sea level. So um, again, we will discuss more about these things, but everything is connected, whether it's plastic, whether it's climate change, whether it's fuel, whether the watersheds of Marikina are, are all degraded. You know, we, we have to tackle this up front, front and center, because technically we only have nine years to reverse this degradation or, and to attain sustainability. Because right now with this imbalance, I think, uh, we are not sustainable and we need to reverse the curve. So maraming salamat and you know, uh, we're discussing plastics right now, but even with plastics, we're already discussing and we are already partly um, addressing sustainability. So nine years to go, it's December and uh, we really need to have our acts together. Maraming pong salamat. All right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Palma. I also remember Ondoy. I was actually a college student back then, yes. and I remember joining the, the relief operations all the way to Marikina. And yeah, you're right that it's something that we always have to remember. I mean, we just went through Ulysses, right, and Roly. So, I mean, this will always happen unless we fix the problem while there's no storm. All right. So, um, can, I, yes, can I just add something? Yes, sir. You know, that uh, based on Pag-asa, the rainfall of Undoy was 455 millimeters in six hours. So that's why it was really mm. so massive, the flooding. Uh, when we had Ulysses in Metro Manila, it's only less than 200 millimeters over 24 hours. And yet the flooding so it's only one, Yes, because we had four, four typhoons in six weeks. And the watershed is so uh, saturated with water. And this is just a system's... Uh, imbalance already that uh, we are experiencing. So you don't need a 455 typh uh, millimeter typhoon like Ondoy to flood Metro Manila as we have experienced a few yeah. weeks ago. Thank you. Thank you for that reminder, Mr. Uh, Sir Joel. So um, now we're going to move on to the talk, a uh, series of talks we have with our resource persons. And the first one being um, a talk on the Philippines plastic problem by environmental lawyer, Attorney Grip Bueta. Um, Attorney Grip is a, a private legal practitioner and consultant based in the Philippines, specializing in environment, climate change, and sustainable development law and adjudication. He has worked with the public and private sector and with various international development organizations. So thank you, uh, Attorney Grip, um, and we would like to see your presentation. Thank you, Pia, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, good afternoon to all um, who joined this webinar. Um, please allow me to share my screen for a short presentation. Okay. Um, so again, good afternoon. I'm Attorney Grip Bueta, and this afternoon I will be briefly talking to you about the Philippines plastic problem. Uh, this is an outline. Um, we'll, we'll start with um, having a look at the plastic and waste crisis. Um, next, we'll have a look quickly look at the COVID-19 impact on the plastic problem. Um, and also a brief overview about government policies on plastics and a few thoughts moving forward once, once we've looked at these issues. Okay. 
and and I'd uh, I'd like to echo what um Pia and Sir Joel said earlier that um we we are indeed in this crisis situation and the plastic problem is something which is indeed related to um to climate change uh, not just because of how we how we plastics are made from petrochemicals from fossil fuels but also because as these plastics and other types of waste go into the environment it affects biodiversity and it harms wildlife which in turn will affect the natural balance of the ecosystem and at the same time again can contribute to climate change so these things are are interconnected okay um, I'd like to to start by defining what a crisis is, and the the, the title of our uh, of, of this webinar is on is um, on the Philippine plastic crisis. But I was asked to talk about the plastic problem. But I think it's it's not only a problem. But what we're encountering right now is is a a waste and a plastic crisis. So a crisis has been defined as an unstable or crucial time in which a decisive change is impending. It's a situation that has reached a critical phase or a time of intense difficulty, trouble, or danger. Or in, in, in literature also, it's the decis decisive moment in that, uh, in that work of literature. So if you, if you look at this definition of a crisis, it, um, it not only talks about a difficult situation or a challenging situation, but it's also that time to, to make a decision on what to do or to take action. So I'd like to... to, to Put to the table that we are we are in a crisis situation and it calls for immediate and, and crucial action from all stakeholders okay so yes we are in a crisis so it's not just about plastics but also waste in general um just to cite a few statistics 80 percent of marine pollution originates from land uh 80 percent of plastics end up in oceans 8 to 12 million tons yearly Every year, we use 5 trillion plastic bags. Can you imagine the amount of plastic bags we use globally? And uh, because of this, by 2025, up to 250 million tons of this plastic will uh, end up being mismanaged and, and will seep into the environment. The cost of marine litter, 8 billion annually, not uh, to, di to different industries, to fisheries, aquaculture, marine tourist, tourism, and also uh, uh, the cost, uh, cost of cleanups. $62 million annual loss to tourism. Uh, here for the Philippines, I'm sure to, throughout this day, we will be hearing more about um, the impacts on the Philippines of this plastic and waste crisis. 16.6 uh, .6 million metric tons of waste in 2020 alone for the Philippines. And um, this, this, is, this is not uh, 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 an easy number to fathom, um, given the amount of uh, our capacity to to deal with these types of waste, and every year this this amount of uh, waste that we generate here in the Philippines increases. And this is not just a crisis uh, on 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 the waste management front; it's it's on multiple fronts. Um, some would call this a wicked problem, or it's a problem which is difficult to explain, difficult to understand, and seems impossible to solve. It's also a wicked problem because it, it, it impacts us from, from uh, uh, different directions. It's more than just economic, as we know. It's a he it has health and social impacts. Um, on the health front, you, you see the um, harmful effects of chemicals from plastics seeping into the environment, especially from microplastics and those microbeads. Uh, social impacts also because you have... Um, we have informal uh, waste pickers who, who need to deal with the huge amount of plastic waste, unsegregated uh, waste, which, um, we, uh, which are dumped indiscriminately. It also aggravates the impact on those who are already most vulnerable, the urban poor, indigenous communities who have to rely on, on the environment for, for their livelihood and for their culture also, women and children, elderly, and the differently abled. So, uh, again, this, this is related to the social to the social impacts of the plastic crisis, and uh, it also increases our conflict with the natural world. I put here that this COVID nineteen nature fighting back, telling us that um, we cannot continue in this unsustainable, uh, uh, unsustainable waste with uh, in, in in how we use our, our natural resources and how we relate to the environment. There are also uh human and wildlife conflicts involved um, recently you might have seen in the news how 
elephants in Sri Lanka have uh, been going into an illegal open dump site and they've been eating the trash there. And uh, they already put electric fence, fences and all these things, but they, uh, they, they couldn't. Uh, now they're thinking of uh, putting, putting a moat around the, the, the open dump. But in the first place, why, why is there an open dump right beside a, a wildlife reserve? Uh, and in Sri Lanka, hundreds of elephants are killed because they, they, they are in conflict or interact with, with, uh, with, with humans in, in, in a bad way. So um, now we, we, are, we are in this, this pandemic and, and this, this COVID-19 situation. So how has it affected the plastic problem? Um, of course, uh, in the first place, government efforts and resources are, are focused on health and social amelioration to help those who are mostly, mostly affected by this pandemic. Of course, it's understood that um, this needs to be the priority, priority of the government. But on the, on the other hand, other services are slowed down or delayed. Um, anecdotally, I've heard stories wherein in barangay officials are saying that their, their waste management efforts, their zero waste program, or their uh, operations of the MRF had to stop or take a back seat or, or become their second priority, given that they had to um, implement the health and social uh, health protocols, which the government mandated to deal with the pandemic. You see an increase in use in, in plastics and other non-biodegradable resources. Uh, we are now using more plastic masks, of course, PPEs and medical equipment. Um, earlier, uh, Pia was say, talking about the, the plastic packaging and takeout containers. Not only these, these takeout containers and extra layers of plastic packaging, but even the paper bags. And, and you will notice sometimes the, the amount of tape that they use to, to seal these deliveries and takeout that we're all getting. And, and this has also resort, resulted in limited choices to go green and to go plastic free. Um, so all these are, are th these are just some of the, the impacts of COVID nineteen on the on the plastic pl plastic crisis and plastic problem. So now, then what are what are some of the government policies on plastics and waste management, which not only operate within this time of the pandemic, but uh, also in general, even before this this whole pandemic started. Uh, of course, um, as a Philippine legal framework, you have our, our constitution, which which states that. Um, the people, the state shall protect the right to, to protect and advance the right of the people to a balanced and helpful ecology in accord with the rhythm and harmony of nature. And I'd like to emphasize here that this, this constitutional doctrine talks about uh, our, our right to have a, this balance with nature. And this should be aligned with that rhythm and harmony of nature. So it's the natural processes. Uh, it's not it's not the, the the processes that we're used to when there is human intervention. Of course, another article in the Constitution talks about the the state's uh, duty to protect and promote the right of people to health and instill health consciousness. Very relevant now in during this time of pandemic. Uh, you also have um, Article Ten of the Constitution, which talks about the local government's duty to um, uh, for the general welfare and to take care of. Uh, issues such as waste management and plastics within their local jurisdiction. On, uh, when you talk about laws, of course, our main law is the Ecological Soil Waste Management Act, or A9003. This recognizes the state's crucial responsibility to adapt a systematic, comprehensive, and ecological solid waste management program. And the law defines this kind of program as something which deals with waste uh, from from being segregated at source, meaning there is segregation in our homes, in business establishments, in commercial establishments. It provides for mechanisms for the collection, transport, storage, treatment, and eventual proper disposal of, of these, these waste. So uh, this is one, this is our main law, so to speak, on, on waste management. And of course, uh, our main law also, which deals with plastic. You, again, you have the uh, local government code, RA 7160, which gives local governments the power to enact ordinances uh, to protect the environment and, to, uh, and, and uh, for the general welfare. Uh, and I, I wanted to point out here that uh, we do not have a national law or regulation on plastics. And uh, you will see earlier, I will, I will cite a few examples of, of some of these policies which are put on the table. But um, right now, you have a more or less 59 cities and municipalities, municipalities 
uh, that have enacted local ordinances that ban or charge or put 11 plastic bags or perhaps have some form of uh, uh, regulation of single-use plastics or plastic products. But um, for, for national law or national regulation, uh, this is still something which our legislators are um, uh, currently considering. Recent developments, I also wanted to talk, uh, briefly talk about this. Um, there are proposals in Congress, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, on plastic regulation, single-use plastic bans. Um, there are proposals for an extended producer's responsibility scheme, and uh, Deputy Speaker Rufus Rodriguez um, has actually proposed uh, one of the this EPR measures in, in the House of Representatives. We have a pending National Plan of Action on Marine Litter uh, being promoted by the DNR. Uh, to deal with to to be our our, our an action plan our national action plan to deal with uh, not just uh, plastic waste but other waste which seep uh, from the land to to our oceans and seas internationally some recent amendments of uh, if, if you, you probably have heard there's a plastic waste amendment to the basel convention the basel convention deals with the trade and movement of, of waste around the world so um, countries have agreed to put more uh, stringent measures on, on the movement of plastic waste around the world, especially from developed countries to developing countries like the Philippines. There is also a proposal for a global treaty on marine plastic pollution, and, and WWF is one of the organizations which ha ha has been pushing for this uh, uh, treaty to, to deal with marine plastic pollution. And you have the post-2020 biodiversity framework and the UK UN Decade of Oceans, um, of course, these deal more with, with nature and biodiversity itself, but within, within the discussions here is also talking about how waste can be prevented from seeping into to nature and impacting biodiversity. So what now? Um, we had a breeze through uh, the plastic and waste crisis in the Philippines. We took a look at some of the policies. So, uh, what what should we do now? What are our key takeaways and and moving forward? What what should we do with the crisis? I think one important message I want to give is that we need to deal with the crisis now. As I said earlier, a crisis is an opportunity to take action and to find solutions. And and I think here, all segments of society need to work together: uh, government, private sector, NGOs, and ordinary citizens. We need to cooperate and collaborate on on viable solutions to this plastic crisis and plastic and waste crisis. We need to focus on implementing our existing laws. Uh, the Philippines has, is famous for having the best or we, we always, uh, we have the full suite of environment, environmental laws and policies, but we, we always, oftentimes we, we lack in the implementation and enforcement of these policies, especially for, for an issue such as the plastic and waste crisis implementing existing laws such as RA9003 is very important to, to deal with the to, to deal and manage the this waste crisis we need to push for new legislation and policies um, some of these policies can include the EPR scheme for the Philippines um, plastics and plastics regulation also um, there are proposals to promote zero waste and other alternatives to um, uh, using plastics and the way we consume things we need to push for and support um, clean production and the use of natural alternatives. These are just some of the, the measures and policies that are being proposed by well-meaning groups and environmental groups here in the Philippines. We can also support global efforts. We should support a call for a marine plastic treaty, urge our government to support it, urge our government to, to pass the National Plan of Action to deal with marine litter. And also, I think for, for us ordinary citizens, we need to exercise our power of choice even during this pandemic. We need to choose well and choose wisely. Maybe when we when we order, when we uh, go for takeout or delivery, we can choose the places which use paper, or we can we can remind uh, the the merchant or the seller not to double up or triple up the plastic for the packaging. We uh, especially during this time, we should support merchants and sellers of natural and local products, especially the. Uh, 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 small and medium enterprises. We need to also focus on reducing our waste. We need to uh, even more uh, practice segregation. We should, um, instead of throwing out um, things that we can still reuse, we should try to, to reuse it until it's really not usable anymore. And we should definitely recycle at home, not just because 
we want this uh, the, the ways to be to comply with the law but at the same time um one of my former professors said that it's also our way of making uh the the work of informal waste waste collectors waste pickers a bit more dignified because they don't have to sift through uh you know unsorted unsorted waste to get to the recycled products and i think we need to take this crisis seriously and to heart you know um uh one of the first steps is to being aware of the issue uh and and to accept that we are in a crisis situation and we need to uh put in solutions right now uh and once you are aware you should share this knowledge with others so that more and more people can can take this crisis seriously crisis seriously and we hopefully will see solutions in the near future. So, uh, maraming salamat. Thank you for your time this afternoon. You know what, Tony Grip? I have to agree with you, no? Na parang nature has become sort of like a vengeful character. If this were a dystopian novel, parang nature has taken on its own persona in this saga, especially the pandemic. Like, I remember seeing the first few months of the lockdown You know, Metro Manila was completely empty, walang traffic, and I was thinking, wow, parang nature has fought back. And but now, obviously, with the with the lockdown easing, lifting, we see again, no, a return to old ways. And I guess that's what that what on un- that's what underpins your presentation that we really need an overhaul. Um, and things like people's motivations and a radical change to their lifestyles is something we we have to figure out. So thank you so and, much and for that presentation. If I, oh, yes. may, if I may quickly add, Pia, and, and like what you said, yeah, we are slowly going back to our old ways. But mm-hmm. if if but still, even if you're going back to our old ways, we are still in we are we are we are going towards that new normal. And um, I'm sure you've heard a lot of people are saying that we should use this opportunity to move to the new normal to actually come up with the better normal or you know a smart normal as some people will say and and part of this will be to be more uh, mindful of how we consume how we throw things how we really practice the the three Rs of reducing recycling and uh, you know this 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 mantras that we always hear about uh, dealing with environmental problems Thank you. Because if we can change our lifestyles because of a health crisis, siguro naman we can change for a climate crisis. So yeah, I really hope definitely, that we'll feel that way. <laughs> okay, so for our next uh, speaker, we have um, Zarina Constantino, who is the national lead for WWF's No Plastics in Nature and the project manager of Plastic Smart Cities. Uh, and she will be talking about how to stop plastic waste from leaking into nature. So it's something we're all concerned about, especially when we see pictures of the storks or mga tortoises who have plastic straws um, in their belly. So those are, for me, very traumatizing photos, really shocking. And it's something that we really have to discuss now, especially us when, especially dealing with a pandemic that has made us hyper-consumerists of, of plastics. So, Za, you have the floor. Yes, totoo yan, Pia. It's really important that we discuss we bring this discussion up and up again and um kasi this is some and as a group mentioned a while ago we are in a crisis and it's very important for us to really discuss ways on how can we on how can we move forward in a green direction i would say so um the studies have been really showing that We are in a crisis. Uh, Grip shared a while ago the different um, statistics, and I would like to emphasize on some of them. One is that in 2020, there was an estimated 11 tons of plastics enters the ocean every year. If and if we do not do anything about it, it is estimated to hope to about triple to around 29 million tons of plastics entering the ocean. So by 24, by 2040. So it's very important that we do something um, regarding this particular crisis. And so also WWF like um, commissioned a study to assess extended producer responsibilities. I understand in the chat box there are questions regarding it. So part of the study is, of course, to first understand um, what is the situation, what is the local Philippine situation. And um, through this, we Um, we created the material flow analysis from where um, we learned that about 
20 kilograms of plastics are generated by Filipinos or are consumed by Filipinos per year. And out of 20, out of those 20 kilograms of plastic, 62.6% 62.6% are low value plastics or non recyclables. And it's very important for us to really um, work on the entire life cycle for us to really reduce or to address this particular issue. Other findings from the material flow analysis is that in the Philippines, we only have 9% plastic recycling rate. And most of the plastics that we have, 33% ends up in sanitary and unsanitary landfills. And take note, Marin Padito, we also have those that ends up in open dump sites. So it's a big um, issue right now um, on what to do with this particular waste. And in... And in this disposal, in, in this plastics that end up in the sanitary and unsanitary landfills, most of these are low value plastics. So it is important for us to make, to redesign, to redesign how we think, to redesign how we consume, and to redesign the products that we bring into the market. And also based on the material flow analysis, 35% um, leaks into the open environment. So it is very important for us to really do something about this because of course, in the next few months, in the next few years, we don't want this to increase. Um, we don't want this to increase. And so what is the solution? So for WWF or for the Worldwide Fund for Nature, what we want is what we push is we understand that the plastic situation or the plastics issue is a global transboundary problem and it requires a multi-layered approach. So um, what we are pushing for is not that we, we should push for change within ourselves, within our households, within our community, extending to the global discussions. We need to bring discussions into the global arena, into the national arena, in multi-layer, as in sa lahat, kailangan mo populate natin, and to really push for change, for us to really address this plastic crisis. And what we push for and what we need to think about is to not just think of it um, think of downstream solutions, so waste management. Ah, um, plastics issue. It's a waste. It's a it's a waste management issue. We should not think of it like that way because we have to think of it as an entire system. We have to address the issue in its entire life cycle. So from plastic production, from cons uh, to consumption, to waste management, and even until to the secondary markets. So it's very important for us to think of systems and how can we address the different systemic gaps in this entire plastic life cycle. So it's important that we push for systems approach and for us to really ensure that um, plastic should not end up in nature. For WWF, we understand that there are necessary and unnecessary plastics. And you know, for plastic packaging, or plastics is used, 40% um, of the use of plastics is on packaging. So it is important for us to really target, for example, um, push for excited producer responsibility for us to ensure that the packaging um, stays into the system, or I mean, it's well managed, it's being redesigned in a way with recovery and also management in mind. So it is important to think in terms of systems and to um, address the plastic crisis in its entire life cycle. So what are we pushing for? As I mentioned, it's very important that we bring this discussion in the global arena. So as Grip mentioned a while ago, it is important that we um, converse with other countries in terms of pushing for a global treaty. We want to push for accountability, not just in the corporations, not just in the government, in the communities, or even now, you know, consumers, oh, why are you buying online my plastic? So let's not let's stop putting blame only on consumers but let's think of putting accountability in all the stakeholders that um that are involved in terms of the plastic life cycle pardon my 
the, at the background. So um, it is important, uh, as Grip mentioned a while ago, that we bring this discussion to the global arena. So it is important that we support or we encourage our national government to push for a global treaty on marine plastic pollution for us to put accountability in the different countries. Also, it is important that we bring discussions to the different stakeholders. Like, for example, we converse or we discuss with the different um, businesses, with the hotel owners, with the um, uh, with the restaurants to better understand how we can eliminate the unnecessary plastics and for us to properly manage the waste or the necessary plastics that they are generating. So, and also, as I mentioned, or as you may have known, we are already pushing, we have launched the Ayoko ng Plastic Movement, which is which aims to really push for conversations. Kasi nga, it's really important that um, we bring this discussion not just on um, not just in our households, in the glow in the national level, in the LGU level, but in almost every discussion that we have. Um, and it is important that uh, and it is it is one of the things that we want to push forward with the Ayoko ng Plastic Movement. We want to bring these conversations to the general public. And then it's also important we acknowledge that the local government units really have a, um, an important role in terms of addressing this plastic crisis. It is important that governments commit to achieve or to um, to increase their waste diversion, which is already and should be reflected in their 10-year solid waste management plan as mandated by RA9003. It is important that communities are involved are involved in terms of segregation, in terms of refusing the single-use plastics, in terms of thinking of ways, uh, thinking of ways on how they can increase collection in their community, increase collection in their city and or municipality, and what to do with the plastics or what to do with the waste that they collect or they recover in those in their particular communities. So it is important that everyone is accountable and everyone is involved in this particular, um, in addressing this plastic crisis. And we understand, as Grip mentioned a while ago with the plastic crisis or with the pandemic right now, the shift in terms of priorities by the LGUs is there. We understand that in terms of budget, of course, ngayon medyo more on health, safety, DRRM, disaster risk and reduction management. So when working with the different cities and municipalities in the Philippines, we understand right now, especially that with the pandemic, budget is an issue. So we push for extended producer responsibility. So it's it's, it's a project wherein WWF tries to understand if this scheme would be applicable in the Philippines and what would be the best scheme or what are the different um, factors or things that should be incorporated in the EPR scheme for it to work in the Philippines. So that is something that we are pushing for in the pushing for with this project. So why EPR? EPR, I, I understand that it's a new concept for most of us, but it's actually a concept since the 1990s. So until now, it's a globally recognized um, approach for sustainable waste management and circular economy. And the reason why WWF is pushing for EPR is we believe that it will push for um, a sustainable waste management and circular economy by addressing this too. So, we, put, we mentioned a while ago that there's a need for us to push for balance between the downstream and also the upstream solutions. So, hindi lang dapat waste management, hindi lang dapat reduction. So, there should be upstream and downstream solution. So, there's a need for us to reduce and also to manage the waste that... Um, to manage the waste or the necessary waste that we generate so and that is where epr comes in so we think that we believe that epr is a way for us to reduce our waste or epr is a way for obliged businesses to reduce their waste by 
starting at the design pa lang. So designing with recovery and reduction in mind. And then of course, we want to push for EPR because this is a way for us to address the crisis that we have. And one of the things that it pushes is for better waste management, for us to really stop the plastic waste leakage into our nature through recovery and management. And then the EPR scheme, this includes the obliged businesses. So for the obliged businesses, this includes the manufacturers, the importers, and sellers. As I mentioned a while ago, it is important for stakeholders to have accountability. And for EPR, we are pushing for accountability for the obliged businesses to assume the full responsibility for the products they bring to the market. But full responsibility, what we mean with this is with uh, we want them to be accountable for the production from the production until the waste management of the products that they bring into the market. This way, we get to reduce the waste that they generate and also manage the waste that is generated with the products that they put into the market. So, paano ba EPR scheme? How does it work? So, these are the different stakeholders included in the EPR scheme. So, we have the obliged businesses, the producer responsibility operator, the waste management operators, the consumers, and also the government. So, as we mentioned, the obliged businesses would need to pay a certain amount of EPR fees that would go to the producer responsibility operator. So this fees would be used to manage the waste that is generated from the products that is put into the market. So this is the interesting part because during the... Um, of course, obliged businesses would want to pay smaller EPR fees. So this is where eco-design comes in because they would need to redesign, they would need to um, uh, change, maybe change your product pack packaging in a way that it gets to be recycled or in a way that they readily reduce already the packaging of the products that they put into the market. So with eco-design, they... Um, they pay a smaller amount of fees and it actually helps because if it actually helps in terms of closing the tap because we get to reduce the plastic, the product packaging at the onset, at the start of the plastic life cycle. That's why it's very important for the EP for this to be included in the EPR scheme. So as they pay the EPR fees to the producer responsibility operator. They get the, the PRO works with the waste management operators for collection and recycling. And in the Philippines, we understand that right now this is being handled by the different LGUs, by the different Philippine cities and municipalities. So the waste management operator should work hand in hand with the LGUs in terms of ensuring that waste is collected and recycled. And something interesting for this one is that for the obliged businesses as they pay the EPR fees, for the EPR study that we mentioned a while ago, we put in a three-year transition phase. Why a three-year transition phase? Because you want to pro provide this opportunity for the obliged businesses to reduce and eliminate the unnecessary packaging in their products and for them to adopt different schemes that would readily reduce their unnecessary packaging. Like, for example, refilling or any other schemes that they can adopt for reduction. And they then continue to sell their products to the consumers. And the consumers then dispose properly the products that they consume. And they and are being now and are now being handled by the different waste management operators. The PRO, since um, it oversees the operations, uh, it ensures that waste is collected and recycled, now also reports to the government. It is important that there's a reporting, there's a project oversight by the government so that we, we are sure and this ensures that there's a good um, implementation of the EPR scheme in the country. 
the PRO apart from reporting to the government on their um, impacts on the things that they have done or on the system itself they also have the responsibility to inform and educate the consumers it is important that consumers are educated on how they can still reduce the waste that they generate and also to segregate because you know segregation is definitely important and it facilitates recycling and it's really important that this is also taken into account in the EPR scheme and this entire system and this all of this flow should be captured in the policy that we push for EPR it is that's why it's very important to work with policymakers for them to push for an EPR bill so that we get to put we have a legal framework that would back up the implementation of an EPR scheme. As Grip mentioned a while ago, it is important to have a national a legal framework on plastics. And I think it is important that we have one and we have one for EPR because we think uh, for the Philippines, it is something that will help us address this plastic crisis. Okay, thank you, Zarina, for that presentation <laughs> with inputs from doggies. Yes, sorry. It's okay. <laughs> Even here, um, I live with dogs also, two dogs. So, palagi silang may input sa mga podcasts, sa mga interviews ko. So, don't worry. We can all relate, I'm sure. Um, so, yeah, you mentioned EPR, no? And that's a very interesting topic. Um, 1990s pa pala. I was a toddler in the 1990s. But the first time I heard of EPR was when in my 20s na. So, you're right that diba, it's not really something a lot of Filipinos know about. But it's about time we educate them about this really a brilliant closed loop system that sana we could adopt here in the Philippines. Um, but yeah, thank you for that. I'm sure we will have more questions about EPR later. Um, so now we're, we're going to move on to our next speaker. Uh, and she is Jonah Delumen Purnia of Coca-Cola. And uh, she will be talking about establishing a circular economy for plastic bottles. So a little bit about uh, Jonah, she took uh, her role of Public Affairs Communications and Sustainability Director in 2017. And together with her team, she leads sustainability initiatives, external communications, and stakeholder relations to strengthen the company's reputation and affirm its longstanding commitment to the Philippines. Um, now, I'm sure everyone who's tried to keep abreast of environmental news also knows diba, that Coca-Cola, for two years in a row, I think, 2019 and 2020, they were uh, tagged as the number one polluter by the Break from Plastic Audit. Break from Plastic Audit. So, um, but because of that, I guess they've also taken efforts to try to close the plastic loop in their company. And obviously, we would love to hear about those efforts and other ways that we can help Coke and other stakeholders, the government, in closing that plastic loop. So, uh, Joanna, you have the floor. Thank you, Pia. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's been such a rich discussion from Grip and from Zach. Uh, it's good that you know, Raptor invited Coca-Cola to participate in this important dialogue. I've already seen a lot of questions of what is the private sector doing on the problem? Um, so really, we are here because we recognize that the world has a plastic waste problem that's been hammered the whole afternoon. And for us, it, it's unacceptable when our packaging ends in the wrong places, such as oceans and landfills. And instead of hiding behind this problem, we are here because we want to be part of the solution. And back in 2018, the Coca-Cola company set out a global goal to collect and recycle a bottle for everyone to sell by 2030. Yeah, slide. Yes, you want every bottle back. And yes, we have a 100% collection and recycling goal, which is consistent with the EPR principles on accountability that Zach has shared. So similar to the earlier conversations, we are also after moving from a linear to a circular economy. And we do these through three schemes of work, design, collect, and partner. We want to design better bottles and create technology to help reduce the need for single-use plastics altogether. We also want to help create or improve collection systems around the world towards our 100% collection and recycling goal. And lastly, as, as I mentioned, the, the problem is interconnected. So we have to partner with other companies, NGOs, LGUs, and local communities to raise awareness and find solutions on this problem. So you may be asking, and maybe you can move to the next slide. Um, great goal, but what actions are you, are you taking now on these pillars? 
And let me cite a few examples here. Um, basically, we support the reduce, reuse, recycle hierarchy. In fact, our biggest packaging type here in the Philippines is our returnable glass bottles. So, kung lumaki kayo sa sari-sari store, yan yung deposit at yung balik. This is 50% of our portfolio. No, my, my only request is just make sure na hindi nyo ipapalipat sa plastic bag pag binili nyo na yung, yung Coke bottle. We also have a goal to use at least 50% recycled container packaging. And last year, we launched the first beverage bottle made of 100% recycled PET or RPET with our Viva water brand. And we didn't stop there. We started using RPET on Sprite and also gave up its signature green color to improve recyclability. So from green to clear. But another opportunity we identified, which is what's in the middle of the slide, is a need to close the loop locally. In our researches, there is plastic bottle collection happening because of its value, but most of these are being exported and recycled back to bottles or to fabric. We need to develop the local recycling industry to close the loop locally, which is why Coca-Cola has invested in a 1 billion bottle-to-bottle food-grade recycling facility. This is a joint venture with our green industry partner in Dorama, and we will be putting this up in General Trias Cavite by end of 2021. And lastly, we continue to partner with different LGUs, NGOs, and social enterprises in plastic collection and recycling programs. To date, we have 30 projects in 16 provinces. In fact, we are working with one now with WWF in line where there are no plastics in nature initiative. And we are also working with other industry partners in farms towards a zero waste to nature map, uh, roadmap, sorry. So these are just some of the work we are doing, but we know that it is still not enough and the problem is still very big. We are committed to meet our goal towards 100% collection and recycling. We want every bottle back. And we continue to look for partners who can work with us towards solution, and that's why we're here. Again, with that, thank you for having us here, and I look forward to a productive dialogue with all of you. Salamat po. Thank you, Jonah, for that. Um, it's very interesting, I think, the way that multinational companies also have to make an effort to uh, close the loop, as you said, the plastic loop, because it's also a responsibility of huge companies who about so many consumers depend on in their daily lives. But we, uh, especially Filipinos, Filipinos love Coke, they love soft drinks, they love parties, and usually soft drinks are a part of that, right? a part of that lifestyle. So it's really great that companies are getting on board this, this kind, these kinds of efforts, and we're hoping that more of these efforts can continue. Um, and yeah, we're also also making sure that we watch each other and see how we implement these efforts. Um, so now we're going to go on to the meat, the meat of this program. And uh, it's really about um, having a roundtable discussion about many of the issues we heard, EPR, uh, how to keep plastics away from nature, um, and how to make sure that uh, our lifestyles will comply diba, with the, the requirements of the times with this crisis. Um, so we're going to now begin the roundtable discussion. But before that, I would like to introduce our very esteemed guests uh, who will participate in this, in this talk. So first, uh, we have sec people representing various sectors who were all a part of this movement. So uh, number one, of course, is the government, right? A very, very important player. And we're really, really honored to have with us Representative Rufus Rodriguez. A little bit, a bit about um, Representative Rodriguez. He is um, representative of Cagayan de Oro Second District from 2017 to two, uh, 2007, sorry, to 2016, and from 2019 up to today. He is also the president of the Centrist Democratic Party. Um, thank you so much, uh, Representative Rodriguez, for being here. Um, uh, from the private sector, we have again uh, Ma'am Jonah, who is representing Coca Cola. Uh, we have Crispian Lau from the Philippine Alliance for Recycling and Materials, Materials for Sustainability. Um, and Crispian is the vice chair and commissioner of the National Solid Waste Management Commission under the office of the president. So, also uh, um, in a way representing the government. He is a private sector representative uh, for the recycling industry sector. He is also founding president of the Philippine Alliance for Recycling and Material Sustainability, which is a non-stock, non-profit organization of stakeholders. From the academe, we have Dr. Tonette Tanchuling, 
who is a director of the UP Institute for Civil Engineering and the chairperson of the Philippine Association of Tertiary Level Educational Institutions for Environmental Protection and Management. She's also a principal engineer at AMH Philippines, an engineering consultancy firm, and she has been studying about solid waste management, and one of her recent work is about the presence of microplastics in rivers within Metro Manila. Um, so I think I've introduced everyone in the panel, and we can now begin our roundtable discussion. Siguro to warm things up, uh, I would like to, I have my own questions. I'm a journalist and I'm very, very curious about uh, this state of affairs. No? And uh, Siguro, I want to ask Representative Rodriguez first, sir, uh, if, if I could ask you, um, you have been um, involved in legislation for EPR, if I read correctly. And I just wanted to know, what has the reception been for EPR legislation? Um, is the executive branch, especially this administration, receptive or supportive to, to the idea? And uh, which sectors naman are the hardest to onboard with this, with this law? Uh, thank you, Pia. Uh, first of all, uh, good afternoon to, uh, uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me to this webinar and the previous speakers. Uh, I have listened intently to their discourse. And uh, uh, for the executive department, the DTI has sent uh, representatives towards uh, EPRs in Japan. And uh, DTI uh, of the executive department is really studying well the possibility of really implementing an EPR program, even in the executive uh, level. But uh, precisely, we filed a bill, uh, House Bill 6279, which is the extended producer's responsibility for plastic waste. And uh, that bill has been filed about, uh, about uh, in the early part of this year. And there is a good, uh, you know, we, we have brought this in hearings already, a chairman of the ecology, the chairperson, uh, Congresswoman Luna Labad Labad, has been able to to uh, to be able to uh, to uh, interact with us and with some other congressmen, but it needs really more webinars like this and be able to get more congressmen to be to learn about this and to be on board. So uh, it's still a lot of work in Congress because not so many yet. So uh, we would like to have uh, you know the organizers now, also the WWF. Uh, Constantino to to go to the legislators. Now uh, I'm not I'm not sure in Congress in the Senate if there is a counterpart measure. I hope there will be because uh, our Congress has two uh, components: the House of Representatives, which is the bigger house, and we have the uh, the smaller house, which is the Senate. And so uh, it has to be both uh, approaches. So that's my answer to you on the status of how it is going in the executive and in the legislative. Mm -hmm. Sir, uh, does, the, does it require a law or can the executive branch go ahead and implement an EPR system even without a law? Well, I can say that they can because we have already Republic Act 9003. This is the Solid Waste Management Act. But when you require, uh, for example, uh, you make it mandatory. This is the purpose of my bill. The bill will be mandatory. Those who are producing plastic uh, packages, our bill makes sure that they will be required to be able to collect an amount of plastic waste in proportion to the plastic generated by them. And that will require law. So therefore, we have here a law that will supplement Republic Act 9003 by addressing the problem of collection of plastic waste setting up a system by which private companies who generate plastic will be responsible to collect an amount of plastic waste in proportion to the plastic generated by them. In other words, this will now institutionalize the environmental policy approach of the extended producer's responsibility to EPR, in which such responsibility is extended to the post consumer stage of a product's life cycle. So in other words, we, the, there will be, under the law, there will be now a creation by of the producer responsibility organization because this PRO will be the one that will undertake the resource recovery of the plastic waste. They will have uh, a MOA with the, uh, with the uh, 
producers of plastic uh, packages and the local governments and the, uh, the uh, people's organizations so that there will be a proper resource recovery. And when there is that recovery, then it can be uh, either recycled. And I'm happy to, uh, to hear uh, Ms. Pernia that they will have a 1 billion bottle-to-bottle uh, -to -bottle recycling because we don't have that industry right now. It's not the only recycle a very small percentage of what is produced in plastic. But if we have that, that is, and then the problem that the Coca-Cola will have will be, will there be sufficient recovery of plastic to feed their bottle-to-bottle -bottle, uh, recycling plant? This is an answer to that need, that there will be producers, uh, the, the PRO will uh, be able to undertake recovery and probably, and then will sell it uh, to the uh, first, to the, of course, uh, by, uh, the ones that will pay will be the producers. And then they can be sold to the Coca-Cola recycling plant. And there will be others that will be built. If you have many ways collected, you, you get them and there will be more recycling plants. Uh, that is the answer there, Pia. Right. Very interesting, sir. And um, I look forward to whatever the efforts will, will be, especially sa Congress. I'm sure we're all going to be watching out for uh, what will happen to that law. Um, so I, I think right now we can give way to questions from participants. Uh, our staff has sent in questions that were sent to us, um, and I'll be going through them one by one. So um, first, we have a question from Olivia Paula Mauricio. Uh, her question is, we always ask the individuals to avoid the use of plastics, but how can we effectively put pressure on the top contributors of plastic pollution, um, i.e. the big manufacturing companies, food and beverage companies, clothing companies, to change course and remove the use of plastics altogether? Would anyone well, like to answer? Will I answer that, Pia? Sir, if you, if you have an answer for that, go ahead. It's difficult. That is why we have this uh, two year, tw 20 years ago, we have this... Uh, uh, Solid Waste Management Act, never been successful. We still have the plastics uh, everywhere. And, you know, they clog all the, the drainage and it will cause flooding and, of course, environmental degradation. I also have a bill, a House Bill 1865, that will regulate shipping vessels, you know, carrying this, this commercial and municipal waste in our coastal waters. No, it's already almost in the finer stages already of hearing. And then we will regulate the dumping. In fact, prohibit them if they will dump waste in our waters, uh, the 15 kilometers, our territorial sea, they should be protected and even the international sea. So that is another uh, bill that I have filed, 1865, an act regulating shipping vessels coasting Philippine waters for the protection of our shores. Now, the question, difficult, it will be difficult to ban plastics because difficult for our producers to be able to get their alternate or the alternative alternative uh, packaging. For example, those uh, producing uh, coffee, producing other products, uh, plastics. If you use uh, uh, a paper, it will clearly after some time be, uh, they will thicken and they will not be good for use. And so this is, this is a win-win situation. We make them be responsible to get their, their waste. But if, uh, for example, there are also other products that could be eliminated, like uh, straws uh, or others, that is a possible option. But my pro pro proposal at EPR is to be able really to have a win-win situation. They can have that, but they recover them. So that is what we have. So difficult really to have a, uh, a systems change in the way we package products. But uh, it can be done. But let us see how this will go. Thank you. Thank you, Rep. Uh, anyone else would like to give an answer to Olivia's question? Yeah, I can answer also from a Coke perspective as it you know, relates to the manufacturers. Uh, I believe the EPR policy is the right way of structuring everything because it's very complicated. But when you look at it in the system that's happening, there is a way that all of us are interconnected and there is a way to hold companies accountable. So equitably on what you put into the market and what you make sure is collected and recycled. So our collection goal of 100% and recycling goal of 100% is consistent with the EPR policy. 
And I just want to comment, Kong Rufus, tama kayo, wala po kasing scaled recycling here in the Philippines. And another opportunity that we are seeing is to develop the recycling industry because it's a law of supply and demand. If there is a demand for recycled materials, recycling facilities will come up and these materials will be collected and there will be increased value in them. So that's the circular economy that we're trying to develop locally. The good news with uh, plastic bottles is that we know that there's already collection that's happening through the informal waste sector. And we just want to make sure that it closes the loop locally. Uh, Pia, think, Christian. add something? Mm, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you, Pia. Uh, yeah, um, just uh, just to add on to what uh, uh, Jonah has said, no, uh, the Philippine Alliance for Recycling has actually started the work on a zero waste to nature campaign with an ambition of 2030 target. So we aim to have short, medium, and long term. That's 2022, 2025, and 2030 targets. And we are currently developing the systems flow that will divert or create pathways for the packaging that we produce, that the industry produces and puts in the market. We need to have pathways as to where it will go and develop the markets. We also want to ensure that any shift in packaging applications will be retained locally. You know, we don't want to shift uh, uh, into packaging that will be imported. So this is one lookout that we are looking at also. And we need to develop, uh, as Jonah said, uh, we need to develop the local recycling industry. So right now, there is really a mismatch. Technology is easy for PET, but there are other materials, you know, uh, that has a potential to be recycled. So if we can create that demand through a zero waste to nature uh, pathway for all these packaging materials, um, then uh, we believe, we strongly believe that we can, we can address the problem uh, towards our 2030 goals and meet the 2030 goals. And for this, we have right now at least 10 companies, 10 multinational, 10 big companies with us now. Uh, it's, uh, it's not much, but it's a good start in our opinion. And we want uh, to, to accelerate this. And once we believe that once the, the, the roadmap has been uh, finalized, um, we, we should be able to encourage a lot more to participate. And, uh, and of course, uh, on the long term, having a mandated, uh, having this mandated by law would really help. You know? But we really do need to do a lot of pilot studies to ensure that it is effective. Otherwise, we might have a law that would be very difficult to implement just the same. Thank you, Pia. May I add also, Pia? Um, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, just to answer the question, I think uh, the question was how do you really push the manufacturers? Uh, just to add to all their answers, I think the EPR, because it's, it's going to charge the manufacturers according to the volume of plastic packaging that is put out correct so that's a good incentive for, for for the manufacturers to lessen the amount of plastic that they're putting out so i think that answers also the the question from the from the audience so then they will have to think to rethink the design or even the material itself or or of course not for beverage because you really need to contain the beverage in something, but maybe in other packaging materials, some are really not necessary. So the, P the EPR would, is a good tool to be able to do that. Thank you. Okay. Um, I was reminded by uh, Rappler staff that there's a Q&A portion, a separate one pala from the roundtable discussion. So um, apologies to the participants. Uh, I will go to your questions pala after the roundtable discussion. All right. So um, uh, uh, now we'll just go through with the roundtable discussion. And Sigura, one question also that had been pressing or what, what we can ask of these of our guests today. Um, we all keep talking about a crisis, right? It's a plastic crisis. But when... Though I, I feel that it's a bit sad that we have to remind people that it's a crisis. Because unlike, for example, the pandemic, people know that right away, a crisis, yan, we need to change our lives, stay home, wear masks, wear face shields. Everybody gets that it's a crisis and everybody will mobilize, has mobilized. But the thing with the plastic crisis, right, is 
people here it's a crisis um but still they will consume plastic they will uh throw away their plastic in whatever way they deem uh convenient or acceptable for their lifestyle and then move on right they'll forget about it until they hear about the next um uh, environmental initiative or government initiative so how do we motivate um average citizens to actually mobilize and radically change their lifestyles or even not radically even just an incremental change that will um mean a lot to to our mo movement to our campaign how do we motivate them and convince them really that this is a crisis um apart from just repeating those alarming figures that we spoke about today yes uh, precisely uh, my bill contains uh, provisions you know we will have a policy change we are making uh, our uh, our producers or manufacturers were responsible for getting back what they produce. But uh, certainly we have to have therefore education, training and stakeholder consultation and public information. Right now, uh, the, uh, the knowledge of uh, the extended producer responsibility is not yet at that stage. That is why uh, all of us are trying our best to uh, be able to inform uh, the public about this. So our, our, our uh, bill would have some transition stage. Why? Why do we need transition? Because first, we have to put up a system. It does not mean that when the bill is passed into law, ayan na, diretso na ang pag-recover. No, it will not be like that. Uh, there will be putting up a system. A system that goes from a, from a who is the, the, who will be collecting at first, because the PRO, the Professional Regulation uh, Responsibility, Producer Responsibility Organization will have to be established first. At first, it will be the companies producing that will collect. And uh, some companies are already doing that. Uh, Coca-Cola is doing it, Nestle is calling, doing, doing it. So they're now collecting back. And so uh, that is one. While we are putting a system, they will already start collecting until there will be a PRO, the Producer Responsibility Organization, set up to precisely be the one that will be able to recover them. Second, we have to have a database. In other words, how much plastic, how much uh, uh, is being produced? And in fact, we, 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 we see here also the representative of the uh, recycling organization, you know, in Japan, they recycle not only plastic, but metal, metal, paper, glass. And so uh, probably that can also be because it's not only plastic that is uh, the cause of environmental degradation, but all of this, including uh, metals, paper and glass. So we, we have that. So there has to be a transition period of five years. So meantime, depending on how uh, the, uh, the producers, how the manufacturers can uh, organize and be able to get somebody to be the PRO, then they collect. So we have this time to put up the system, information, education, training, and then come out with a database so that anybody who would like to go into this has already the basic data that we have. And so those are the things that are needed to be able to move forward. Now, with this law, hopefully, if we are able to reach more legislators, and we are to approve this mandatory uh, extended producer's responsibility, then there will be a period of transition and we will be on our way to get a win-win situation from what we have now. Pia. Anyone else maybe from... Hi, um, Pia, may I... Um, yes. Get this, Attorney Gizia. Just, right. just okay. very quickly. Um, I, I, if, if I may, I think one, one reason why the, the crisis is hard to understand for people is that... Um, it, it, it happens periodically. It's not something which hits all of us hard quickly, like the pandemic. The pandemic changed everything for us uh, in an instant, in, in just a few days or a few weeks. And I think that's, that's what makes it difficult for people to realize that this crisis needs urgent attention. Um, and as we know, climate change and a lot of our environmental issues take a, 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 a long time for us to feel the effects. So, so probably one way to, um, to make it more real for people, make the crisis more real, and, and echoing what uh, the deputy speaker was saying, is um, we can uh, creatively convey the message to people. Uh, you know, um, 
um, Ina was sharing to me a, a factoid that um, a, a car, a Honda Civic, is weighs one ton. And uh, traffic in EDSA only has about 257,000 cars per day. So if you think about the, the, the 11 cars or 11 tons of waste, that's that's you know that's that's uh, I mean people can can relate that ah oh, okay uh, eleven cars of waste they can quickly imagine it and also probably um, uh, scaling down the the information in local dialects or the different regions that might also help uh, I recall there were some NGOs before that um, to to make um, environmental laws and I think also election laws more relevant they they came up with comics. Because in the region where they were making comics are very popular with with new voters and with uh, with also the younger generation who they wanted to teach about uh, environmental issues and, and election laws during that time. So um, creative ways of uh, uh, giving that information I think might also help to make the crisis more real for people. Thank you. Yeah, you mentioned about how we need to explain certain phenomena also to people who may not um, see this every day but in their lives. They don't always see plastic in the seas. Maybe they're you know, in their condos and don't really see the dump sites and um, all of these effects on the ground. Um, so we also have to talk about um, how to convince people or explain to people EPR, right? It's the meat of the discussion and it's also very complicated. Like there's this whole web of systems that people have to understand the way that it's a closed loop. Um, and, and so, Siguro, we can also start by uh, talking about any best practices that any of our guests maybe have seen, have seen for themselves, whether in the Philippines or abroad. I mean, something that can be used here as a model na, um, we may not have a law yet, but it's something that uh, Representative Rodriguez is working towards. But in the meantime, diba, do we see any um, outstanding practices of EPR, even in a small scale, happening in communities? Yeah, Pia, if I may, mm -hmm. on to that. Um, yes, I think, uh, yeah, um, Congressman Rufus mentioned this, no? uh, that there are companies already that are doing on a pilot scale different kinds of programs. No? Uh, Coca-Cola mentioned about 30 programs that they are running. Uh, there are different other different companies like your Nestle, your Unilever's, uh, your Procter & Gamble. All these companies are doing things on a pilot scale. Uh, why are we doing this? We are doing this to understand the system, you know, and uh, PARMS provides a platform where we can now share experiences and find out how we can put this together and establish the system that is needed, you know, and in the long term that will be mandated for all. Because uh, what we have found is that, and what's interesting is that a, a, a single system that works in one city may not work in another city. This is kind of interesting also. Um, the, the deputy speaker also mentioned one key element, education. You know, education is key. Uh, we can get rid of all the plastics if we want, but if we replace it, and if we don't change our attitudes, our manner of disposing things, then, you know, it defeats the purpose. Uh, I also believe from a recycling point of view, that EPR needs not only to be not only for plastics, but all types of packaging that is put in the market, you know. And the development of the recycling industry should not only be limited to one aspect of uh, the or one particular material, but in all the materials that we have. You know, you see, uh, if if you observed over the past few years, where local governments have banned the use of plastics. There has been an increase in consumption of paper, paper alternatives. Um, but over the years also, we have found that recovery for paper has gone down. You know, this is an interesting fact. You're putting more materials in the market, uh, but then the materials that's put, that's put in the market goes to disposal also in an infrastructure that is not enough. So we, we need to look at this holistically. We need to look at all materials, all packaging, and make it holistic. And uh, yeah, we, we uh, industry fully supports you know the programs, and we are not going to wait the no, three to five years. We we need to start now, and we have been starting now. We established farms as early as 2015. Getting companies together was difficult. It took, took us three to four years to get the companies together. Uh, and I think uh, uh, I'm sure that Congressman Rufus would be very happy if you're looking for a PRO 
uh, PARMS can be that platform for the PRO for you already, and we can offer this. And we are currently doing what we need to do, uh, getting all stakeholders together and evaluating what we need to do to, to uh, lessen the footprint in our environment. Hmm. So, uh, Sir Crispian, you, you mentioned yeah, those initiatives, no? and um, we all know that LGUs play a really significant role here. How was your experience in getting cities uh, on board your project, especially with implementing an EPR? Which, what are their issues coming into this, uh, and how did you address those issues? Well, of course, uh, yeah, the, the, the challenge to us really is uh, the, the three-year cycle of an LGU. You know, um, the, 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 when we develop mm -hmm. programs, and we have experienced this uh, directly, uh, you have a three-year cycle. You have to pray that the mayor is there for the nine-year program so that your program gets continued. Uh, otherwise, th there are instances. No, I'm not saying all. No, uh, I'm just trying to be politically correct, but I'm saying that there are instances when, when a new uh, chief executive is there, they don't want to have anything to do with any good programs of the past. So this, we need to find a way to really uh, stabilize. And once we have done, a, and it needs to be from the community. You know, we partner with the local government, but we strengthen the community. We strengthen the community groups. We strengthen the informal system and try to give them more opportunities for, for income. No, um, where, if we can formalize them, it would be great, but it's difficult to formalize the informal. So let's just give them a bigger income potential and let, let them take a very important role in this scheme that we're doing. And if we are able to do this, I, I believe that they, uh, the, the whole system would benefit. Pierre, yeah. can I? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to react because it's a very good uh, statement of uh, Mr. Lau. No? And uh, indeed, uh, we need to really have recycling. Now, uh, I would be willing to sit down with, uh, not to sit down, but have a Zoom meeting with uh, with uh, Palms, no? so that we can have a law that will give all the incentives to recycling. So like now, Coca-Cola is already in, uh, Jonah, no? So uh, what are the incentives given by the government? There should be, because this is one way to attack the problem of uh, waste, of solid waste. And uh, if we have a, a, a law, uh, we want to have uh, a uh, Mr. Lau and others who, who would like to draft a bill, let us already push these uh, incentives for uh, recycling. So, uh, so when we have... Uh, Mr. Lau uh, be able to help uh, Congress uh, craft a bill to give really incentives to recycling plants so that we can invite not only our domestic businessmen, but foreign businessmen as well who can get into this, especially when we have already the EPR and we have already more collection of this uh, to be recycled waste, then uh, we can have uh, this particular law that will give incentives. Thank you, Pia. All right. Um, next question would be for uh, Dr. Tanshuling and also uh, WWF, so Zarina. Um, Siguro, you mentioned EPR no, and how a lot of people say it's a Western thing. It's something that only Western countries will be able to do. There's that criticism. So uh, how do you think that EPR can be made to fit into the Philippine context? I think it is important that we really um, base it on local data. That's why for the EPR scheme assessment study that we did, we actually contracted or uh, worked with uh, the team of Dr. Chuling for us to really identify um, if EPR is the way to go for the Philippines and uh, what is the current generation, where does our waste, uh, our plastic waste go, for us to really identify on how, um, on whether EPR is the way to go and what are the guidelines or what are the things that should be incorporated in the EPR scheme for it to work in the Philippines. So it's important that we, and I think uh, the other speakers have, have been mentioning this, it is important to really build on the data. Dr. Tenshuling, any inputs? Uh, regarding the EPR thing and how to localize it, I think Zarina has explained it well. But if I may add regarding information, uh, earlier, I think Congressman Rufus was saying to have a database and GRIP was saying about being creative. Uh, I, 
this is to your question regarding changing the behavior of the consumers and making them realize the crisis that we are in. I'm, I would also suggest that it would be good if we can maximize the use of internet. Like I was thinking maybe Rappler can have its website and publish, for example, WAX data of LGUs. This way, or, or the companies, or whatever audits we, we have, this way it makes the people realize and inform about what is happening. And that's one small effort we're doing right now. I think there are many groups who are trying to do that. And like having some mobile apps where it's it's like looking at the weather, what's, what's the temperature today? So it's something also that we can develop, like how much is this city producing? Are they reducing their amount of plastics? I think in, in terms of consumer, I think we need consumer education. Um, with that, you can, you can, uh, you can influence their attitude and make them realize the crisis that we are in. Last question to go for the round table, then we will have a short video from WWF and then we'll move on to the q and um, I'm just really, really curious, no? like especially for Coca-Cola, um, Ma'am Jonah, how, how do we convince companies to support EPR? Because to me, it seems like they will have to pay the rent for the system to happen, right? So what is the incentive here for companies, I mean, aside from the, oh, it, it sounds good, but you're doing something for the environment. Is there a, like a, a tangible, a concrete way to convince companies to onboard here? Or it will just have to be kind of a top-down approach? I, I think, and maybe Crispian, you can help me out here because for us, we, we were the ones who were one of the first who decided to commit to it even before somebody told us to do so, which is the 100% collection and recycling. And, and for us, it's it's unacceptable when we see it out there. Eh? We, we really don't like it when our brands and packaging are seen in the oceans and the landfills. That is not how we, as a Coca-Cola company, operates anywhere around the world, uh, which is why we are holding ourselves accountable and taking responsibility for it and collecting and recycling it. And hopefully, as more companies get into it and realize that it makes business sense to, to take the problem from end to end, um, it can inspire more. And that's why at least we have farms as a group that helps the common thinking and a common roadmap towards these solutions. Crispin, maybe you can build for what we've learned with the other companies. Yeah, it, it's, it's not easy, you know, because um, uh, when, when, we, uh, when we are doing this, as we are doing this, uh, different companies are uh, at different levels. So uh, it is really critical for us uh, to to have, you know, a good mass. You know, the ten companies that we have uh, will will be influencing the others. And mind you, the ten companies that we have are not all global companies. We're very happy that there are some local companies that want to do something, but they don't know yet. So basically, the global companies have 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 a, have an advantage because of their global targets already. Uh, and and I think from there we we should be able to to address uh, to address this. Uh, uh, then big brothers, you know, uh, taking the lead, you know, and then all the smaller ones can can come later on. So the the, the perspective is this: the way we're looking at this uh, on how it can take off, uh, we can have the big companies to come forward first uh, through pilots, uh, given that they have already made their commitments. And then the other companies, uh, we, we, we shouldn't um, discount the fact that the MSMEs have to be a part of it also. So yes, it will be a challenge, but if they see the benefits in doing this, I am sure that local businessmen, including MSMEs, will be supporting this initiative as well. Um, what we need to inform businesses is that, okay, yes, we, we go for you know, one policy direction, you know, it's tough when you're saying that I'm going to ban you and implement an EPR. So it's going to be tough if the message is like this. So if the message is EPR system, right, I'm holding you accountable. No? Then everybody now will support this because the, other, the, the, the stick you have on the other side is a potential ban on the packaging material. It will shift the packaging also um, uh, as, as with the presentation earlier. 
if your product is recyclable, you pay less or you don't even need to pay at all. You know, using that concept right now, everybody now will look for packaging that is recyclable so that they, they don't spend much more in recovering that, you know, because the system for recyclables is already there. So that's how we are looking at it. And I, I believe, I strongly believe that the industry will support this. Um, we, just, we just need to show the, the good cases when we do the pilots. Okay, so thank you for that. Thank you everybody for participating in the roundtable discussion. We'll now have a short video break, uh, but I would also suggest for the speakers, for our speakers, maybe you can also spend this time with the video break looking to your right on the chat because uh, a lot of our participants have sent in questions and um, feel free to respond to them yourself. I think they're addressed to specific speakers. Yeah? Like I think there's one here for you know, for Crispian and for, for the rest. So um, this is a good time, Siguru, to just take a breather and look at the questions, see what people are thinking, um, and then we'll come back with the Q&A. So here's the video. Our ecosystems are critical to our survival. Yet every year, an estimated 11 million metric tons of plastic enters our oceans. Despite growing efforts to stem the flow and create a more circular plastics economy, plastic pollution continues to fall through the gaps at an ever faster rate. A UN treaty on plastic pollution has the potential to address the problem at scale, and many countries are already calling for such a solution. A solution that closes the gaps, but works for businesses at the same time, with less regulatory complexity, a stable investment landscape, and simplified reporting, while at the same time benefiting the planet too, protecting our environment from plastic pollution. A global problem needs a global solution. A global agreement on plastic pollution can unlock a cleaner future for all. So that was the video and, and now we can resume our uh, the program and we are going to begin with the Q&A. Uh, I have here a lot of questions from the audience um, and we'll start, start with the question of Maisel Paunil and this is for Coca-Cola, for Ma'am Jona. Um, her question is, how come Coca-Cola is still labeled as top one plastic polluter for the year 2020? And I think um, it's because diba, you, you've, been, you've joined Parm since 2014, I believe, and still uh, you, you have this this headline that Coca-Cola is the number one plastic polluter for this year and also last year, I believe. So, As I said earlier, it's not something that we are proud about and that's why we are working towards solutions. Um, and the solution is an ambitious one to collect every single bottle back and not only to collect it, but to recycle it. And with such an ambitious goal, Small pilots, and, and Chris, and I know that we're working on pilots because we need to learn, but we realize that we need to go big, which is why we move towards a recycling facility and invested in one. Because if we're collecting all of those bottles, we need to do that. One part is about developing recycling, but it's also about spacing out non-recyclable products. So the solution to recyclables is to recycle and collect every one of them. But for packaging footprints that are non-recyclable, we need to phase them out. 
And of course, we continue to support our packaging that's more sustainable, turnable glass bottle that we continue to use in our system now. So I think that's um, different ways of answering that question. And we hope to not be on that list sooner rather than later. Thank you, Jonah. Uh, we have a question from an anonymous um, person, <laughs> anonymous participant. Uh, there appears to be multiple well-meaning groups that are all trying to find solutions. Is there a committee that is looking at putting all of these groups together to come up with a unified solution? How can the regular Juan reach out to these groups or committee so that we can not just start the conversation on this, but also take the necessary action already? Would anyone want to respond? Maybe WWF or uh, Dr. Tanchuli? So in terms of the organization, so I understand that, and I think we mentioned this a while ago, that there is a national plan of action that is being um, developed or being finalized with the Department of Environment and Natural Resources. And I think one of the objectives of this NPOA is for them to also consolidate the different or um, create groups or um, identify the different stakeholders that they can um, tap into in terms of pushing for the different um, for the different guidelines or for the different approaches for us to address uh, the plastic crisis. So it is important that um, we that we get to learn more about this NPOA and then once it's launched that we get to work with the different stakeholders that have been identified in this particular plan. In terms of um, how can a simple one reach out, definitely there are a lot of organizations working on um, plastics. So we have WWF, we have a lot of um, with a lot, of, a lot of other NGOs like Save Philippine Seas and a lot of the NGOs under the Break Free from Plastic movement. So I think a simple one, it's a, it's a simple trick is so, so, social media is a big thing right now. So it's one thing that they can approach them via social media. They can readily like message them. Definitely a lot of the NGOs, a lot of the organizations would have a Facebook page and that, that, that uh, they would were in they would feature the different activities that they implement and also ways that um, simple individuals or individuals can um, take part in. Okay, thank you for that. Um, we'll move on to another question from Danielle Pobre. Sashi culture is prevalent in the Philippines too, especially in the lower sectors. How would the government and the major companies be able to provide a solution to this? especially as this isn't an environmental problem alone, but also a social class issue. I, I fully agree. I think that we cannot simply say, let's ask people from using sachet because it's an economic problem. For Although I know there are uh, there is also a sector who find it convenient, like those who travel, they, they like bringing their shampoo in sachet but i would say majority of the users of the sachet are because are the are those who cannot afford to buy uh, products in in bulk so i fully agree that we should continue on working on those on the poverty levels why in the first place can they afford to buy in bulk so maybe what can be done also is by the people themselves like a community or form a cooperative where they can where they can afford to buy in bulk and then distribute it among themselves uh, that's one creative uh, way to go about it i know i heard from the i don't remember now but it's the shampoo it's a multinational company they tried to do refilling stations but it's being uh, regulated also, I think by the FDA, yeah, to do away with the with the sachets. Yeah, and um, I, I'm reminded of a, a story or a comment by by one of the I think uh, from one of the groups Gaia. They were saying um, before we started using these sachets and and bakak hindi mo pa na pia sa mga sari sari store laging may refilling. You bring your own bottle, you bring your own container, ng mga suka, toyo. Uh, I think I, I vaguely remember na may mga sari-sari store pa na ganun. But if that could be done before, why can't... I mean, that that's what a lot of the environmental groups are saying. We can go back to 
to simpler times na you bibili ka ng tingi-tingi eh. hindi naman kailangan na it's in it's in a sachet um, so i guess i i guess also uh, i agree it, it is a social issue it's those who um, have less or who are uh, in the marginalized sectors who rely on on cheaper sachets but um Partly also, I, I would think, and, and as I would tell some of my students, it is because we, we are now in a more um, convenient society. You know, we go for the quick, easy solutions. So instead of, um, I saw Dr. Net saying, telling to one of the student participants here that you can bring your own containers and all that. But um, some of us will not do that because ayaw natin may hugasan pa tayo or ayaw natin na baka tumapon sa bag natin. So, we go for the the plastic container from our favorite coffee shop or, or when we buy our food, you know. So, it, and so it, it, again, it, it, it can go back to us also. The way we uh, practice our daily routines and the way we uh, make our choices, uh, it, it, will be, it will be possible to, you know, um, move away from the sachet culture. Yeah or lessen the amount of sachets we use. Thank you for that. Uh, next question is something similar to the, ano, to the question that we just answered. No? And it's about, again, individual actions. Um, but this is related to the 11-11, 12-12 sales we see on Lazada, Shopee. And um, the question is from, sorry, it's a long list, um, Althea Serad. No? And she's asking, for e-commerce sites, there's just so much waste during 11-11 and 12-12. Even small businesses are piggybacking on these campaigns, and there's just so much waste. So her question is, how do we, um, you know, how how do individual citizens start a campaign to push people who, I guess, the, the vendors who participate in these sales to use biodegradable plastics as packaging, like cassava bags? Pia, if I may respond to um, use of uh, biodegradable plastics or biodegradable mm -hmm. alternatives, uh, we have to uh, look into first the cost of these materials. Right now, it's uh, rather expensive, so it becomes uh, very difficult uh, for, for the market to absorb the added cost uh, for biodegradable plastic. Uh, and secondly, just because it's biodegradable, you know, you, you need to ask, do we have the infrastructure to deal with the biodegradable waste that we are already generating right now. You know, the, the, as an individual, we generate about half of our waste is biodegradable and a lot of those waste and still ends up in the landfill that emits methane. So there's a climate issue there also. Uh, what, uh, what needs to be done uh, is to, uh, instead, uh, and of, of course, uh, shifting things to cassava. You know, uh, I, I was talking to BOI governor not before in ex, uh, exploring cassava as a, as a packaging material. We also have to, to um, uh, consider its effect on food security in this country because cassava is actually the base material used for feeds, for poultry. So if we plant, you know, then, then it is important for us to split up or dedicate land that will be producing plastics for biodegradables and land for food crops. You know, otherwise, uh, as happened in Mexico before, uh, there is a potential shift. You know, instead of uh, producing for food because there's more value selling it as packaging, they will shift there. So, so this is some of the things that we have to look into. Uh, but having said that, I think um, apart from, just to go back to the earlier question, apart from looking at refill options, and the challenges are always there. Um, industry is also looking at the sachets and finding out how we can make sachets recyclable. And we have done some work on that and we have uh, gained some level of success. So we are now changing the design of sachets so that it becomes more recyclable. Uh, and that's one of the, the pathways that we are looking at in the roadmap that we are developing. Mm. I think that's a, a contentious issue, no? Because there are some people, the man, who would believe that using plastics, uh, even while there are recyclable versions, in the in the end, they do not biodegrade as well as uh, paper, for example, wood or other packaging. So, and the issue here is microplastics. They might end up at the oceans, whereas if you use biodegradable, diba, um, you may churn out more paper products, but at least these paper products will will biodegrade and won't cause as much harm to the environment. So uh, would anyone want to bring up points like that or uh, maybe respond or also answer the question? 
I think PA it is important that before we push for any solution, we get to understand that particular solution. So some people right now they're pushing for biodegradable packaging, and this is something that we need to study first. Um, we need to understand in terms of um, its design, in terms of how is it it um, it um, sustainably sourced, basha. How will it be managed? So there are some factors that we need to consider in terms of pushing for any solution, and in terms for pushing, uh, in terms of any lobby for change. Um, I think there is a petition right now, or there are um, groups pushing. I think it this includes um WWF pushing for change or for discussions with the big companies for the 11, 11, and 12, 12. Because as I mentioned a while ago, it's not just the response responsibility of the consumers but also there's a responsibility and accountability from all the other merchants and including also the e-commerce side so yeah thank you ja, for that uh we will go to our last two questions because we've extended na pala by eight minutes so just last two questions from the audience and we have one from um george chow so he's asking epr may have may take some time to have its effect on the plastic crisis Aside from EPR, what other measures do we have now that serves as a quick response or short-term slash quick solution to the current plastic crisis? So we say, oh, I'll just start. So EPR scheme, we say that this is a, a long-term solution. This is something that we need to push for. We understand that we need to have the policy in place. We have to have the database in place. We have to have the PRO in place. And we understand that for us in the EPR study, we put in the three-year transition phase. And as we um, get to that particular phase, we're in all and ob oblige businesses are mandated to really pay the EPR fees for the product packaging that they put in, into the market. It is for us, it is important for us to push for solutions. So right now we need to build and our next steps actually for the EPR study is really populating or communicating how do we popularize EPR and also building on the basic waste management system so that when it is already mandatory, there's already a waste management system that we can build on. Hindi yung after three years, saka lang tayo start. Kasi the plastic, we are already in a crisis. And the solutions, we need to generate it with the different stakeholders, with the communities, with the individuals, with the businesses, and with the local government unit. And then in time, when all of things, all the system is in place and all the different solutions are, are out there, when the EPR is mandated already, then we can tap on these different solutions for us to push for um, eco-design and also to also push for um, a better waste management. Okay, so I think the, the recycling facility being up by end of 2021 will be a good start that's a scalable level. And the Philippines still has a very underdeveloped recycling industry. And even I had joined that recent World Bank Forum compared to our ASEAN neighbors that probably has a developed like 80% market on recycling. Nasa 25% pa lang tayo eh. So I think there's still that part that as more companies invest, and I know that more companies are looking at the Philippines because they're very clean yung feedstock natin. So the informal waste sector is very strong that they are able to collect that. So we are confident that the bottles will come as long as the value is seen in those bottles. And as we recycle, Sana, more facilities are up, then more circularity will happen. Right. Thank you, Jonah, for that. If I may, yes. Yeah, if I may quickly add also, I think one quick solution is, and, and, and a lot of our panelists were mentioning this, is that we properly implement our existing laws, uh, especially RA 9003. And um, I, I'm reminded of uh, this. You, you should, we should push for, uh, as an example, the establishment of MRFs, uh, materials recovery facilities, in all barangays, which is mandated by the law, but unfortunately is not uh, being implemented by uh, by many LGUs, because through the MRF, that's where uh, you get to compost organic waste, which com uh, which uh, is more than fifty percent of the waste generated by by Filipinos. You get to separate already what's recyclable or what's reusable. So 
it's a uh, in, in 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 a way it becomes a community activity also um, many environmental groups will will show success stories of MRFs being uh, impl- uh, successfully implemented at the barangay level at the community level so for, for me that that's one uh, that's one quick solution of course you can push for your LGUs to actually uh, establish or properly uh, put in place a sanitary landfill instead of the illegal open dumps. But that, that would be a, a big ask for, for LGU. So MRFs might be a, 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 will, will definitely be a good start. Okay, thanks, Grip. Uh, we are going to move on to our last question from the audience and for this event. And this one is from Paeng Lopez. So Paeng, I think, is from Healthcare, Healthcare Without Harm. I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Paeng, but um, his question is for Representative Rodriguez. Do you think EPR should be part of a bigger single-use plastic phase-out bill to ensure that we are able to plug all holes on plastic pollution? Uh, uh, we are trying to have a win-win situation here. To ban single-use plastic immediately may, may, may have adverse effects on not only uh, the manufacturers, but the consumers. Uh, that we have. So uh, we are trying to have the EPR uh, go uh, and do go fast no? to be able to have that. Uh, we have the transition period and we have the implementation period. And so uh, I hope that uh, in our committee and the Committee on Ecology, uh, this has already been part of, uh, of the uh, uh, substitute bill. The bill also has a uh, ban for single-use plastics. At the same time, it has EPR. So we're trying to uh, we're trying to have some uh, how to be able to consolidate them. But my uh, proposal really is to make this a win-win situation: manufacturers, consumers, government. So that is what we have on the EPR. We hope that uh, there'll be more webinars like this, and I don't know how we can reach the other congressmen. Because uh, uh, if we are able to convince them on the EPR and we have more support, then we can have a fast, we can have a fast approval of House Bill uh, 6279. So that is my answer to the question. Okay, thank you, Representative Rodriguez, for that. Uh, with that, we will sadly have to end our webinar because uh, we've already gone over time. And it's mainly because all of our speakers are very passionate about this topic. And we also have so many, so many questions um, sent to us through the chat. Uh, and this is really just proof about that this topic is something important to a lot of us. And uh, we really are hoping that we can reflect or kind of spread this passion for this topic to the general public because none of this will work if Filipinos, the, the, the larger population, will not also adopt this practice. Um, thank you everyone for joining this webinar. We hope you learned something. Uh, we will be streaming this webinar, I believe, next week. Uh, we will just keep you updated on when uh, so that we can try to get the, this movement with as much um, promotion and uh, awareness as possible to everyone who is concerned. Um, and uh, just to wrap up, we, we uh, talked about EPR, legislation for it, what communities are facing, the challenges ahead, and how we can motivate people to see this as a crisis that we all have to mobilize just as fast as we did with the pandemic, you know, upending our lives just to make sure that we are all safe at home. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And thank you to our speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Everyone.